May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. I had a great vacation last week in Paris. I, I went back to do a, a French language immersion program, so I spent Monday through Friday, 9 to 1, in a small class of eight students learning French. It was really a lot of fun. It struck me after a couple days, all the other students in the class were in their 20s, so that was interesting. Uh, was, but it struck me how we were all there because we had a sort of dream. I have a dream of someday being able to have a conversation with someone in French in a, from another culture, in their own language. I'm not there yet, but someday. But the, uh, there was a young man who had been working for Facebook, he's from Italy, he'd been working for Facebook in Ireland, he met a girl who lives in Paris, he's moved to Paris, and he wants to be able to carry on a conversation with his girlfriend in her own language. They currently communicate in English, which is both of their second language. There was uh, a, another young man from India who had just graduated with a master's in computer science. He followed with his girlfriend who wanted to live in Paris. He's learning French so that he can get a job and start kind of his life. And there was a young woman from Columbia, a recent uh, law school graduate, who wants to get involved in international law. She's moved to Paris because that's a good place to do that. She's learning French as part of a, a, a dream she has in her career. Uh, dreams in that class, dreams of what life would be like, dreams of oh, what learning French might make a difference in our lives. The Bible, as you know, is chock full of dreams and dreamers. Way back in the book of Genesis, we meet Jacob, Abraham's grandson, Isaac's younger son. Jacob cheats his older brother Esau out of his inheritance, and then, fearing for his life, he flees into the wilderness. And alone and frightened, Jacob falls asleep, and he has this remarkable dream, vivid dream of a ladder and angels ascending and descending, and in this dream, God tells him that it's going to be all right, that his children will, be, will uh, create a whole new nation, that he will be the father of a whole new nation, a chosen people on earth, God's chosen people. Later on, Jacob's son Joseph gets into hot water because of his dreams, his dreams of him having a better life than his brothers, to, uh, annoys his brothers to no end. They throw him in a pit. J Joseph ends up being carried off to Egypt, where his dreams help him, help the Pharaoh save Egypt from the famine. And Joseph lives out a good life, dreams speaking to him about how he's supposed to go through his life. Joseph's namesake, Joseph of Mary, and Joseph, in a story we heard just about a month ago, Joseph goes to bed one night thinking life is pretty good. He's got a new fiance, he's uh, married, and he's got life figured out. He goes to, to, to sleep, and the angel of the Lord appears to him in a dream and turns everything upside down. Tells him that his fiance is expecting a child, that this is all right, that Joseph should marry her anyway, and that his child will be named Emmanuel, God with us. Dreams and dreamers throughout the Bible. And then there are the waking daydreamers, those people who look out at the nightmare of the world, the nightmare that the world often is, and proclaim what God's dream for it is. And we call those daydreamers prophets. There's a, the book of Isaiah, 60-some chapters of a collection of prophecies, and we heard one of them today. The biblical scholars call the, the speaker in today's passage, the prophet in today's passage, the suffering servant. The suffering servant knew, knows in his heart that he was chosen by God before he was born. He was seen by God, named by God, chosen by God before he was born to be a light to the nation of Israel, to be the voice of salvation to his country. But things have not gone so well. The speaker finds himself, the suffering servant finds himself persecuted, hated, in trouble, and he's trying to figure out what has gone so wrong. How could he have been so certain that God had chosen him, and how could he be so lost today? And God's message comes to him and says, don't worry. Things do look pretty bad right now, but it's going to be okay. In fact, your dream for your life is too small. You are not just to be a light to your nation, to the nation of Israel. 
You are to be a light to all the nations, to the entire world. You are to be the messenger of salvation to the entire world. Our Christian tradition has sometimes understood the suffering servant to be fulfilled in the person of Jesus Christ. But whether that's what Isaiah had in mind or not really doesn't matter. What matters is, once again, we see God speaking through the unlikely person. As Martin Luther, the great reformer, said, God rides the, sorry, God carves the rotten wood, God rides the lame horse. God speaks through whoever God chooses, no matter how unlikely that person may be, no matter how tired they are, no matter how persecuted they are, no matter their situation in life. On the night of January 27th, 1956, Martin Luther King Jr. was a 27-year-old pastor. He had moved to Montgomery, Alabama just a few months prior to take up his first church. He had great dreams for him for his life. His, his family had great dreams for his life. His father had been a pastor, his father before that, and he was going to shepherd churches uh, uh, and, and, and be a pastor to his people. A few weeks previously, Rosa Parks had refused to give up her seat to another white passenger on the bus, and thus started the boycott. Young Martin Luther King, fresh out of seminary, 27 years old, ended up heading up that effort, largely because the older, more experienced black ministers in town knew what a dangerous and difficult job it would be. They were only too happy to let this ambitious, energetic young man be the front person for this undertaking. It was exhausting trying to figure out how to get the black community back and forth to work, how to provide transportation when they were refusing to use the buses. It was, uh, there was tension in the black community about doing this. He had to work hard. They would meet almost every night to kind of uh, encourage the community to stick to their guns, to continue doing this no matter how, no matter how difficult it was. He was getting threats regularly. Just a few nights before this, he had been arrested, and he'd been sitting in his parked car. He'd been arrested for going 30 miles an hour in a 25 mile an hour zone. He'd been in prison for several nights. He was there in the middle of the night. His wife and his children had gone to sleep. He was exhausted and spent the phone ring, and the voice on the other end said, we've had just about all we're going to take from you. You and your family should leave town. Martin Luther King Jr. hung up the phone and sat on his kitchen table and thought he was done. He had it. He was exhausted. He had nothing more to give to this effort. And in the silence of that night, in his despair, in that dark night of his soul, he heard the voice of God speaking to him and saying, it's going to be all right. Do what you know to be right. And you know the rest of the story. He continued on. He persisted. The, boy, the bus boycott was ultimately successful almost a year later. Martin Luther King continued to receive death threats. His house was bombed. He was stabbed. He was attacked continuously by authorities, by, by the, the uh, white folks. The, after the bus boycott, he continued to do his civil rights work around the country. It led him ultimately to that uh, civil rights march in August of 1963. He had been so busy with the organizational details of how to get all those people to Washington, D.C., that when it was his time, turn at the end of the afternoon to get up and speak, he had had very little time to think about what he was going to say. And if you, you can find it online, if you read the first part of his speech, it's sort of flat. It's clear that he really didn't know what he was going to say. <laughs> Mahalia Jackson, the great gospel singer, was on the platform with him, and she said to him there in front of everybody, Martin, tell them about the dream. And then Martin Luther King continued, I say to you today, my friends, even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. It is a dream deeply rooted in the American dream. I have a dream that one day this nation will rise up, live out the true meaning of its creed. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all people are created equal. I have a dream that one day on the red hills of Georgia, children of former slaves and the children of former slave owners will be able to sit down together at the table of fellowship. 
I have a dream that my poor little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And you'll remember on and on and on he goes, articulating that dream of an America where all are treated equally, where color or race makes no difference. Martin Luther King didn't live to see his dream to fruition. And we're still waiting for it to come to complete fruition today. Things are certainly better than they were in the 50s and 60s, but we're not there yet. His dream continues to motivate the work, uh, to, to continues to be a vision for our work together as a uh, society. You are here today, and I am here today, because our parents, and their parents before them, and their parents before them, had a dream. They had a dream of family. They had dreams for you and me. They had dreams about what our lives would be like. They had dreams about what kind of difference we would make in the world. They had dreams about how the, our lives would be a blessing to the world. So on this week, when we remember the life and ministry of that great dreamer, Martin Luther King Jr., I encourage us to spend a little time reflecting on what our dreams are today. What are your dreams for yourself, your dreams for your family? even if they seem audacious. What are your dreams for this church, for this community? What is your dream for this world? How is God speaking to you in your dreams? In the same way that God spoke to Jacob and Joseph and Isaiah and Martin Luther King. May our dreams for the world help bring about God's dream for the world. May we, we be inspired by the dreamers who have come before us. Amen. Amen. Amen.